John and Paul, welcome to Tax Five. Thanks, Robin, for having me. Thank you, Robin. Now, it's great to have you here, and this is a really interesting discussion and, and very timely with all the staffing shortages that we're seeing around firms at the moment. So it is the start of the year, and it is important for practitioners to have hopefully had an opportunity to take time out, and reset, recharge, and come back into the year reflecting on what sort of opportunities are available for the way that you're running your practice. We know that 2023 was a challenging year for many reasons, including the staffing shortages that continue to grip firms across the country. So there are opportunities out there to consider different pathways and looking at options and solutions that might improve the way you are resourcing your practices. So, John, can I start with you and just the basics, the the language that we're using? What is outsourcing? What is offshoring? And is there a difference between the two? Thank you, Robin. Yep, it's a common common question. And uh, when most people we talk to and they haven't really been exposed to offshoring, they just think offshoring and outsourcing are the same thing. So um, the models are different. Uh, outsourcing really is, um, you know, you take a, a, a piece of work and, you know, an actual job that goes to a, another company, usually in another, you know, offshore location somewhere. They do the work based on, you know, quote the work on, number of hours or on completion of a particular of that particular piece of work and then that comes back to you in in shape. Um, offshoring on the other hand is more of a labor hire arrangement where you have your own staff solution in another location. Um, you're building your own team under your systems and training and management. So you re- I would say the biggest difference between the two is that it is the issue of control um, around workflow. Offshoring, you have full control. Outsourcing, you're giving that control to another company. There are lots of different models of offshoring, and some might involve using your own staff. Others might involve contractors or using labour hire firms. Can you run through some of those different models, how they operate, and what are the advantages or disadvantages of of using these different models? Uh, Yep, so... uh, I mean, when, in the early days, we would often engage in, in you know contractors. Uh, when I was in when I was in my accounting firm, we had you know managers that would um, just be brought in for specific purposes to do you know bits of pieces of work. And I suppose that is, um, you know, in terms of remote staffing, it is it is a flexible remote staffing arrangement that's similar to to offshoring. Um, so you get the flexibility. Um, and the skills you need without having to put in a lot of training. Um, you know, if, if you go to the next, I guess, a, another level of kind of mani- manage a more managed service, which would be uh, there'd be an actual office in a, in a location with staff working, you know, and then you're really kind of like renting the desk, you know, in a sense, renting the infrastructure, the, the internet, um, and then the, the salary and wages Really, you're you're just paying for those plus that that monthly sort of infrastructure charge, which would, you know, or a service fee or a leasing fee, um, uh, you know, and that and that still gives you that element of control over over what's happening. And then the next probably level after that would be uh, going to full outsourcing, where there's some management in 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 place watching over that person that you're working with, and and you you're kind of you've taken the the workflows more on them than you. Yeah. Throughout the pandemic, we had such a shift in work practices and and the working from home, that acronym WFH has become so familiar to all of us. Is this just an extension of that? So prior to pandemic, the idea of people working remotely was occasionally out there, but certainly not uh, a mass idea that was embraced by the profession as a whole. Now it's become so commonplace and we're used to dealing with people virtually, uh, even this recording, we are recording uh, virtually as well. So is it just an extension of that or is it something completely different? Uh, Yeah, good question. I I would say, so work from home, um, it's the difference there is probably being in the home. It's, it's, um, Remote remote work or, or multi office um, is similar, but it, but it's uh, you know a bit more infrastructure around that person's working environment. Um, I mean, for us, we have 
a, a, a big combination, you know, um, big combination of staff that are working from home or working out of our office in Manila. Um, and certainly the pandemic has has broken down some of the walls that people had up around a kind of a setup like that. Um, so, so yeah, true work from home would be you know, working in, in the home and, and then, but, but I think remote work is probably a little broader than just that. And it's the idea of a firm being used to, well, we're going to talk about control and security and all those sorts of issues as we get further into this discussion. But it is a a cultural issue, and it's a mindset, and it's a a shift in terms of the way you might have run your practice in the past. Yeah, definitely, and and I think, I mean, yeah, Australian firms, we've all been through that, haven't we? You know, we, we, through the pandemic, so so we've all been forced along that journey. Well, I'll come to you in more detail shortly about your experiences, all of this, but just as an initial question. How do you go about venturing into this space? What's the first thing you've got to think about or how do you go about taking that first step to go into offshoring? Uh, I guess it's probably a little bit easier now than what it was nine years ago when when we first started. Um, so when we, when we did it, we I guess we looked at the different locations, whether it be India or Philippines, and we decided to um, head over there with with one of my partners, and we then went to a number of of uh, different outsource companies within the Philippines, and really looked at what then was the was the best match uh, for us, and that's uh, that's how we came across Frontline, and we've been using their their services ever since. But it's it's finding the right match, the company that that works uh, with you. And it's going to get the best outcomes for your for your business. So it's really looking at those different fits, the cultural fits, um, and all the other aspects of their of what you need to do. As we look at the sorts of countries, and and you've mentioned the Philippines, Malaysia, but there's also offshoring in India and Vietnam, uh, other countries. So what are some of the considerations when you're choosing a particular country as the right fit for your practice? Um, the, the language was, was one of the, the, the first obvious things that people have concerns over. Um, I guess people have had the, the phone calls, um, and, uh, with people trying to sell them different, different products over the years. Um, and what we found culturally, the Philippines was, was quite similar to Australia. Um, so it was, it was, a, I guess, previously a U.S. sort of base um, there was a lot of US influence within the country and cu- culturally uh, their English was was very very good they were highly trained um, their time zones were were quite similar so they were working in a, when we were working at similar times in Australia so it meant you could get on the phone you could talk to them you could zoom call them um, so all those sorts of aspects were important because you've the staff overseas have to culturally melt mold into your to your practice and the and the culture of your own business. So if you can't do that, if culturally they're they're way different, then it's going to be very different, very difficult um, for your business that way. Now, Australia is always a long way from anywhere. Uh, it takes seven hours just to leave our shores in most cases. But if we're talking about physical proximity, um, some countries might be more attractive than others in that respect. Absolutely, um, and the Philippines is um, only a, I guess, a relatively short flight of um, around eight hours, whereas some of the other um, countries are, are further away. Um, plus, all the infrastructure in Manila makes it, uh, you know, the IT is is quite sophisticated um, for in comparison to some of the other countries. So, nine years ago, I'm sure the Vietnam and India and those sorts of countries have, have advanced a lot further, but we just found a much better cultural fit um, to our practice, and that's what drew us to the to the Philippines. Um, John, what do you find is the main driver for the decision to outsource? Is it always about saving money? Yeah, uh, not usually. Yeah, I mean that that is a benefit to to using and you know going offshore. You you can operate out of a lower cost country um, with low, lower wages and things, but. It, the majority of vast majority of clients that we're 
I mean, prospects we're talking to are doing it as a staffing solution. You know, unemployment's been low here. It's what three and a half percent or something, and it's been low for quite a while. Um, particularly in r- rural or you know regional locations, it, it's there's just limitations, and so um, they're getting access to you know the 20, 20 million people living in in the Manila area and over a hundred million in the Philippines as a whole. So there's just this whole other. Um, pool of talent that they can access. And we're, of course, noticing the challenges of getting grads and, and young professionals interested in this profession. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, we think it's wonderful. Um, we're decades into it and, and we can't think of doing anything else. But uh, try to get younger ones interested and attracted to tax and accounting and audit. Uh, it is yeah. a challenge out there. Absolutely. When I started as a you know university grad, someone invited me along to a CA evening somewhere and and I thought wow this is a great opportunity and it sets you up in the business world and all that sort of stuff but clearly that hasn't been you know we've got the image problem in this area with young the next generation they don't see it the same um, and, and talking to some firms I was speaking to I think a firm from it was like um, it was regional Victoria and there's a university in their in their area and the volume of accounting students coming through just isn't there at the moment so they're you know, they had to look, they weren't actually look, wanting to do offshoring, but sort of had to because they needed some other alternatives. John, let's turn now to the, I guess, the, the business side of things and the serious side where we need to look at risk. How does a firm in Australia manage issues such as quality control, yeah. supervision of staff, the culture, the regulatory environment, particularly cross-border, and training and supervision of um, making sure that the staff are up to speed in the technical sphere. A uh, lot of issues in there. But oh, can you unpack some of that? Um, <clears throat> yeah, no, absolutely. It's ultimately offshoring is going to be an extension of what you've got going in your own firm. So if you've got good quality control procedures before you're offshore, you're probably going to adapt those into the offshore team as well. So. You know, there's some there's some key things that I would look for when I'm talking to someone that has never offshored. Um, have you got firstly, have you got someone that's got the time to to supervise the the staff that you're about to hire? You know, they're going to come in, they're going to need lots of training, um, they're gonna, you know, learn new softwares and all that sort of stuff and have lots of questions. Um, and it's just not going to work well if they don't have a, a friendly face at the other side to to be able to get help when they need it. Um, what else was there there? So that, that, that's that's a big one. So if if the partner partner is swimming in work and can't get can't get stuff out the door, offshoring maybe not the best solution because they need there needs to be some freedom at the in the early stages to help that that new person. Um, Quality control. Yeah, quality control. So, um, I mean, if you were to hire a grad out of uni, um, you, you would, you'd have probably keep a pretty close eye on their work progress. Are they actually, you know, are they improving? Are the review points being repeated over and over again, or are they, or are they, you know, learning each step of the way? So, so I mean, in the early stages of quality really comes down to good training. Um, need to, you need to be prepared to put some some training into the team. We, we have some training training programs that we roll into some you know that that, that some of our clients take advantage of, um, and ongoing supervision beyond that. So it's not a it definitely not a plug and play. It's not a set and forget. It's this is a new team member. Treat them like a. They'll come to you with some good accounting skills, you know, debits and credits they should know, maybe not so much on the Australian tax all the time, so that needs to be trained. Um, so you, you need to have someone reviewing their work, providing that feedback um, to make sure that by the time it gets to partner level or out the door, it's been checked and and um, at that the quality that the firm would expect. Um, which you would do anyway if you had a if you had a grad come in and and um, learn from the ground up. Um, obviously, th- there's security things to 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 um, consider. So, and, and again, no no different to any any work from home setup. You need to have um, that that security environment needs to be sort of considered. 
Um, I mean, Paul probably would have some of the specifics about what they do in that area, but but generally speaking, it's it's things like um, you know the, the hardware. So you know, we provide sort of encrypted computers that that you know where where you know USB hubs are, are disabled, and um, so staff can't easily just grab things off and do what they want with it. Um, there's monitoring type software if needed. There's, um, you know, you should think about password control and, um, and, and, and you know, the normal the normal things that your, your IT person would want to look at. We have an IT team, so we're often working with IT teams um, to make sure that, that that is all sort of flowing from firm to offshore staff on a, on a consistent sort of security environment. Well, from a practical perspective, I'm particularly interested in the cultural challenges or opportunities and also the regulatory environment. So how do you manage both of those and ensure there is cohesion with your own practice? Um, Probably just jumping back onto one of John's comments before I I run into that, Robin. Um, The one point I'd probably make there is it's not that different putting on a new overseas staff member to putting on a grad here in Newcastle, for instance, you're going to have to supervise them. You're going to have to time, have to put in time training them. And the more effort you put in at those early days, the better outcomes you get into the future. And it's it's no different from an offshore perspective. Um, it really works in, in the same way. So um, I guess I don't want people getting the impression it's more um, because it's not, it's, it's, it's pretty similar. The difference is, is you're doing the training via uh, a Zoom or a phone call compared to walking up to their desk. But if they're working from home, then it, it's really, really no different in in that aspect, sort of thing. So um, the the key the key point there is really you've you've just got to put the time and effort in if if you want to succeed in the in the offshoring environment. You've just got to put the time in, just like you would with your normal staff in Australia. You put the time, you'll get the results long term. So it's a it's a long play, if if um, if that's what you're looking for, sort of thing. So, um, in terms of the uh, your question, um, the, the cultural aspects and and engagement, um, what what we did as a firm is um, we got our staff locally engaged by having a local mentor. So what they would do is there was a responsible senior staff member in Australia who who dealt on a probably a daily basis quite regularly with with the staff, um, and that building that contact between the staff uh, built relationships. Um, we also would bring we've brought the our Philippine staff to Australia to to give training. They then get to meet all the team in Australia and and it has worked very well, even for our local staff. Our local staff really get a kick out of seeing, um, you know, the staff coming from the Philippines. They've they've never left their country before. They've, you know, they they turn up in Australia with, you know, their eyes are as big as as dinner plates, and um, and they get an experience. But um, you get it back tenfold because their enthusiasm once they've been here. They've, you know, our staff take them out. On the weekends to do touristy things, but that all that all is a part of the the business of of moulding them into our culture and and building those those personal relationships. So that's probably the key building building strong personal relationships between the staff in Australia, and that's why we I guess we've I've been the consistent sort of partner who will regularly along with other staff. So it builds the the whole team and the, and the strength into the into the team. So. I guess um, um, our Australian staff see how, from the top, how the partners deal with with the staff over there, and they're treated like any other staff. Um, and I guess that's we're, we're leading by example. What's the legal nature of the arrangement? So, are they contractors? Are they employees? Are they your employees, or are you paying fees through the intermediary? I guess technically they're not our employees because I think the, the John can answer this. The legal, the legal um, aspect from the Philippines is they're not our employees, but we see them really as just another employee uh, mm. of, of our practice. But is that that correct, John? 
In substance, they're your employees, but for the, for legal and payroll purposes, there's a we have a company that that you know deals with the tax and and the, the legalities of employing in the Philippines, and so so um, yeah, the 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 way um, like Paul would would pay if Paul wanted to give his staff pay rise, then he can you know, and that just get notified to HR or whatever, and that'll just go on the invoice and be passed through straight to the straight okay. to the uh, the team member. So. Um, but yeah, there is a like I guess you'd call it an employer of record in the Philippines um, to to handle the, the, that 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 type of thing, the legality of it. And they are dedicated staff for your practice pool. So whilst they're it's an arrangement through this intermediary, they are still wholly allocated to you. You're not uh, having them part time or sharing them with lots of other practices. Yeah, that that's correct. It's I guess it's probably calling it a labour hire arrangement. Just like you, you you could employ um, staff in Australia. It's exactly that same arrangement. So you have your your invoice for the staff that includes every every cost, um, the provision of the of the seat, the computers, the technology, the IT, uh, the staff wages. Um, probably a hopefully a little bit of profit margin in there for John, so he continues into the future. And that that aspect um, is, but in in all other aspects, um, they're seen as our employees. So when we put the time and effort into them, um, we see the results through their improved skills and experiences. And the you know one of the staff that we started with is still an employee nine years later. Gosh. So well, say, firm, how do you protect yourself? From whatever risks might be associated, really, no different to any of our other staff in Australia. We have um, our two-factor authorities um, authorizations on all of our software. Uh, most of the software we're using now within the practice is is cloud-based. Um, we can switch them off. We can, you know, if we ever had, we've never had to. If we had to kick them out of software or not give them access, um, then it's it's very quick and easy, and it could be done uh, instantly. So, um, and and certainly the IT controls that are in place um, in uh, in frontline is uh, is as as good or probably better than than what we see in Australia. That there, there, there really is leading edge technology to to ensure that um, there is no. No breaches of technology, and yeah, touch wood, we've we've had a, an excellent experience, and and, and no issues um, in any of this time. I'd like to delve into your experience a little more. What difference has this made to your practice, and where do you see the benefits continuing into the future? Um, I'd firstly say it's been a very, I guess, a very positive experience. Um, what it's done is it's given us uh, capacity that was. Uh, one of the the main reasons that uh, we we started looking at the offshoring um, quite a, quite a few years ago, um, it's also provided us a well trained, very stable workforce. So, what what our experiences were, and I guess probably many we're a, I guess a medium for a medium sized firm was, we'd find that we'd spend a lot of time. Uh, we'd put graduates on every year. We'd spend a lot of time training them up. They get up to intermediate level, and that seemed to be the level where um, people in their careers made different choices. They decided to. They wanted. You know, I had a staff member who joined the police service. Uh, you know, staff who would wanted to go to Melbourne to to see the bright lights. So you'd spend a lot of time and a lot of resources training staff up for three, four, five years. And then they'd turn over. So then you'd be back to square one. So from a client perspective, which was, I guess, um, top of the list for us, it you, you saw t- t- turnover, um, and that wasn't a great outcome for for clients. So one of the one of the top benefits uh, um, with using the offshore staff has been the the, the stability of of clients, sort of um, in that um, you know junior through to to sort of um, you know, mid-range experience, it's it's been a really good a really good outcome uh, for us, sort of thing. So, um, and uh, probably the other point, we 
we, like many firms, when we first started out um, down this road, was um, wondering what was going to be the, the client's reaction. Um, how will our clients react to using using off, offshore staff? A um, little bit nervous to start with, but we found pretty quickly that the client, our clients just wanted a good service. And what this did was it enabled us to provide a better service. We were able to be more responsive. We had capacity. So you, know, you, you really don't want a staff member in Australia sitting around with no work to do. Um, but if you've got a staff member offshore that is uh, is costing you, you know, significantly less, you can have a little bit of excess capacity there that if something needs doing, then it can be done instantly because you've got that capacity. So that's that was sort of a, another another key aspect, and and the client reaction is, you know, they've seen better service, more you know, quicker reactions. Uh, their their response times uh, have only improved with that capacity. So um, uh, they've they've been uh, enthusiastic through through the process as well. Not everyone likes it, and you know, uh, I've got a couple of clients who um, who. For some whatever reasons, haven't haven't been a fan of it, and we just use local staff to do it. So, but having those offshore staff frees up the local staff as well. Um, but there's also, you know, there's arguments around that having a a lower cost um, with those offshore staff gives you the ability to and the capacity to look after your Australian staff even more as well. So Are everybody any of wins. the foreign staff client facing, or have any contact directly with clients, or is it only the Australian staff who deal with your clients? Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, we we have uh, a number of our offshore staff dealing directly with our clients, um, and uh, we have we provide bookkeeping services. Um, we have uh, mortgage broking, our admin for there, our uh, power planners in our financial planning practice also. So broadly across all of the staff in the Philippines, they they deal directly, obviously, with supervision, just like with any other staff member. Um, but if you need, you know, something sent off quickly, some ATA reports, you, you know, a, a payment slip, uh, you know, any anything along those lines, then um, uh, they have that direct, direct, direct contact. And, um, the, the clients are, are just happy to get good service. And these are skilled, you know, these are highly skilled um, staff over there. Some of our staff have done the equivalent of, you know, CPA, they're university trained, and they're doing bookkeeping. So you don't always see those sorts of highly skilled people in Australia providing that service. To give our listeners a sense of the sorts of differential in salaries or wages that are being paid, if you had, say, an Australian worker on seventy five to one hundred thousand k a year, what would be the equivalent in the Philippines for your workers? the The range obviously depends on experience, but in the, in that sort of range, um, with all the on costs, so wages, uh, we've got they we provide medical, yeah, even even down to their their presents that you you, know, you send to them on their on their birthday those those sorts of things um, the administration costs providing premises IT services um, internet all of those all wrapped up probably cost us in the range of twenty five to thirty thousand dollars a year Australian so we're talking roughly a third say of what the Australian equivalent would be yes that's correct yeah it's quite a significant saving. Uh, staff training is something that, um, you know, certainly with my background, it's something that is, is dear to my heart and important and um, and it's worth sharing also that um, for our listeners, uh, Paul was a, a training client of mine a, a long time ago and for a very long time. So, yeah, it's nice to have a chat with you again. But in terms of staff training, you run that for your Australian staff, participation by uh, the foreign staff as well? Uh, yes. But just like our Australian staff, we want them as highly trained as, as we can get so what we do is um, we involve them in all our internal uh, technical trainings. So if we do an online webinar, they will also log into that. Uh, we also will travel a couple of times a year to the Philippines and I'll take staff with me because uh, my staff are much smarter than I am. So they will do all of the – they will spend time training them and we also – 
uh, from time to time, bring our Philippine staff out to Australia and, and give them a couple of weeks of intensive training as well. Now, something that I know is a challenge when it comes to getting access and security. Let's talk MyGov ID for a moment. Because in Australia, you've got your various strengths and, and with our Australian driver's licence or our passport, you can, of course, get the, the highest strength possible. When you're a foreign individual, that's very difficult. And usually it's just the standard that is the maximum that is capable of, of being um, obtained. How does that work in practice for you? So does that restrict the ability of the foreign staff to do certain things because they can't get their MyGov ID to the strength that might be needed for the tasks that are being done by those in Australia? Uh, yes. Yeah, that's that's true. So uh, with MyGov, the only level you can get them to is the basic level. And it's a bit of a process. It's not as easy as you would for an Australian. So you've got to lodge uh, paperwork with the Australian tax office. You've got to get certified documents from the Philippines to send off to it. But it gives enough access for a lot of the basic um, transact, you know, pulling reports off, getting information off. Um, but there's the upside as well where I guess a lot of practitioners would probably feel uh, uh, positive that there are restrictions then on what they can do. So they can't go in and change bank details for, for a client. Uh, they can't go and do other aspects of that that you can with a higher level like of ID. So it actually provides some, some additional levels of, of security uh, within the practice without really stopping everything so the, the 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 access is adequate for what we for what we need them to do and it also gives some um, uh, people who would be new to offshoring the, uh, the the confidence that you know a client's refund couldn't get sent somewhere else but you know an Australian staff member could do that as well so there's no different to any other employee risks but um, people have concerns in that area so it uh, it's a it's a strength a strength as well having that aspect of comfort around that exactly. John, I want to go down a couple of pathways now. Those who have been early adopters with this approach of of resourcing their workforce, and those that are yet to venture down this pathway. So, what would be your key messages for each of those groups? So, let's start with the early adopters. Okay, so early, early adopters have had plenty of experience and don't sort of need to be told what to do and how to do it. It's It really is, um, I guess, just an, an analysis of how their overall firm's going and how those staff are, you know, are growing and and progressing in, in relation to how they'd expect an Australian to, to do. And, and in my experience, I mean, I, I did this myself for about a decade. Um, you know, I like Paul, I had people start and, and I, was, I had, you know, spent nine, 10 years with them and saw them you know, move up the up the up the ladder really to that manager level and able to handle quite complex things on their own. So you, you um, I find sometimes some firms will tend to put a little bit of a cap on their offshore team for some reason. Where maybe it's like you know you'll only ever be able to do bookkeeping or or things like that. So I, I my approach is really don't put limits on what they can do. Um, with the right input, they'll grow and and. Um, progress like like anybody um so hopefully that answers your question for the established ones uh you've talked about a possible warning sign where screens go black on video calls can you oh, explain right. that yes. okay so best practice is really um uh to, you want to have cameras on you want to you pl plenty of contact with the the team i i you know, recommended sort of a daily huddle or some check-in on screen, you know, regularly. Daily is is probably best practice at least. Uh, you know, where things have fallen off the wagon a bit is where we had one client that didn't that only emailed his staff for nine months, never called them, never did a Zoom or anything. Um, to be honest, I'm surprised that the person stayed that long. Um, we've had others that are that are you know, we've had people in tears in Manila because they've been chatted on, on from a, a manager in Australia, and it's just, um, you know, maybe some some all caps. You know, I think the words were "damn it," you know, in all caps on on to do with a particular issue, but the staff thought they were directing that at them, um, and so and it's just just a real um, signal that there's not 
the communication's breaking down a bit. So, so I would say extra effort around communication because we're all in remote, we're all working remote, um, and and that really keeps things moving, keeps things, you know, working well. So screens start going black and they start doing email only and, and they're not engaging with you. That's a, a reason yeah, to be concerned. Definitely. I think um, oftentimes partners get this and they their partners usually are partners because they're good at what they do. They're good with, with people most of the time. Um, it's they'll delegate it to a manager and perhaps that manager didn't want to work with an offshore team or is it, you know, it's a little bit intimidating. We've never had dealt with Filipinos before or something like that. Uh, and that that's probably where, you know, you, you just want to make sure that those things are being done the right way. Paul, any comments on that? I was just going to say it's, you wouldn't have an employee in Australia and put him at a desk and not talk to him for nine months or only send him emails. It's really not that hard. Yeah. You talk, you walk in, you talk to your staff in Australia. That's all John's saying. It's 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 no different. It's not that hard. Yeah, and and in addition, there's there's social things you can do. I mean, you know, some firms will have, you know, let's say a celebration, someone, I don't know, a birthday or a significant anniversary or something like that, and everybody gets pizza. So they order pizza over in the Philippines, not pizza in Australia, and they'll get on a call and have some banter and fun all eating their pizza, you know, that, that sort of a thing. Be, be creative. Now, the groups that are yet to venture down this pathway, if you're coming cold, if you've been adverse to this idea in the past, if you're reaching the point where you're still struggling to find staff and this really could be an option, what would you say to them? Yep. So we talk about it in depth in the in the book, but there's three components that you really need for it to, to work well with an offshore team. So, um, and I see it's a bit like a triangle or a three-legged stool. You have to have all three things in place. So you've got um, good systems in place. That you need to have checklists for things people to follow. If it's all in the partner's head, it's going to be hard and frustrating training, you know, um, and, and getting productivity. Uh, so, yeah, think about the systems. That you get. Most firms are pretty good at that. Uh, training is, you know, one of the legs. And and monitoring is the other one. So accountability. So it's your daily catch ups. Um, your your you know if you've got whip that you're holding your team accountable to, billing targets and things like that, then hold the offshore team to that as well. Make sure that they know what their targets are, you know, and and that it's visible. I think the real um, really good spot to be with this is to is to set things up. In, in a way that creates an internal team pre uh, peer pressure so that if if there's visibility on what everybody's doing, um, you know, team members can see other team members' activity and, and that sort of thing, then there's, there's just, a, it's not all on me to make sure that they're performing. It's, you know, they don't want to look bad in front of their peers. So it's, it's just a way of setting that up so things are visible, reports are visible, you know, that, that sort of thing works well. Paul, well, you've made the comment to us uh, in our planning discussions on this that most of the risks associated with offshoring are not specific to offshoring, that in fact they exist with Australian staff as well. And I think you've made that point a few times throughout our discussion today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the the aspects of offshoring are they're very similar to having employees in Australia and it's it's really just being consistent. It's just making sure that you communicate with them, you treat them as any other employee, and that's that's really the the, the key. Um, and and just dealing with them regularly, just just like we, you would. Like I said, it's uh, it's not rockets. It's not rocket science in that respect. So, and if a firm ventures down this pathway, they get into offshoring, they set it up, they run it for six, twelve, eighteen months, two years, whatever, and then they find you know what, this is not for me, how easy is it to unwind or to exit from that particular arrangement? Yeah, that 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 has happened, you know, in, on rare occasions that firms have gone down the road and, and for whatever reason it just hasn't worked for them. Um, obviously, from our perspective as, you know, with a, star, a staffing company, um, 
we have quite a few other clients that would be extremely interested in in staff that have got some experience. So it's it's quite easy for us to say, well, let's make an agreement and find new homes for them. Um, but look, the normal proceed there's normal procedures that would be followed around, you know, making sure that. Um, is it performance or whose end is the fault? Is it the staff's performance or is it, you know, the firm really didn't do their part um, and kind of making assessments about where those staff, you know, how what their future would look like in the, in that regard. Um, but you, you would normally, you know, st- standard sort of procedure would be two months notice to switch off um, and then we'd try and find a, a quicker solution if if that's on the cards. And John, you've had the rare situation where you've actually asked a client, a firm, to leave the arrangement. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, we've had we've had a few. Yeah, where it normally what well, we'll get warning signs. You know, we've got a we've got a an HR team that are checking in with staff, you know, welfare and all of that sort of thing regularly, and we might hear. Oh, such and such wants to resign. And that's not unusual. I mean, staff everywhere don't stay forever, but it's more when um, let's say the whole team wants to resign, you know. Uh, okay, we've got some problems, you know. So it's it let's pull out all stops, let's find out what's been happening. Um the ones where it's it's usually mutually agreed if that in those situations or Perhaps the firm didn't realise, and they want to turn that around, and you know, we'll work with them to try and salvage. Um, where it had to be turned off, I, like I said earlier, it was you know we've had two or three where you know new managers come in, their people skills are not, are not really you know like the old one was. Let's say and they, they, you know they, they sort of see it more like software or a, you know something that should just happen automatically that in terms of their offshore team and. And um, it just turned it into a, you know, the offshore team didn't respond well, and it just turned it into a mess. So, in those situations, you've got to, yeah, you've got to make some calls. Um, we obviously our interest, we want the, you know, we want to look after the staff. Um, we want the clients to be happy, of course, but they yeah, it's it's uh, it can be a bit messy, but but we would come to some sort of a, a plan to work it out. Thank you. Paul, any final comments from you as to uh, recommendations, advice, your suggestions as to whether this is a good idea for firms and and what benefits it could bring them? Um, I guess like anything in business, um, owners and and partners have got to continuously adapt. We've got to consider new uh, innovations, technology that we can improve our business. And I guess uh, offshoring has, has been around for a little while now and I think that most businesses should at least consider it to see if it is a fit. Um, is it going to improve uh, their services to their clients? So there's that aspect to it. I, I guess also there's a risk factor there. Um, if you're potentially not using offshore staff and you've got competitors within within your local area that are using those, is that going to put you uh, at a disadvantage? So I think um, that firms also need to to consider that. But on the other side, uh, they they might go down the other path where they differentiate themselves um, by not having offshore stuff, and and it's not for everybody. So I'm not not suggesting that that either. But uh, I think it's important to to uh, to consider it and to uh, make sure that all those aspects and benefits. Um, but for us, it's uh, it's been a great success. We've um, it's given us good capacity. It's given us a good stable workforce uh, across all different um, divisions within our with our business. And uh, to some extent, it's now quite critical to our business. Um, if we didn't have them there, our uh, our staff, um, then uh, that would that would be uh, quite a difficult outcome. Um, and just having great stability. And uh, yeah, they're just a, you know, we've got a great team there in the Philippines, uh, and uh, they do a great job. And it's not just that low-level work. Um, I guess yeah, John made mention before. We've uh, we've certainly not capped the sort of work that that our staff do, um, and they do 
everything from you know dealing with the ATO, talking to the ATO on the phone, all the way through to self-managed super fund, super fund audits, uh, all different uh, structures and quite complex work. So um, we've we've found just like with our Australian staff, if if you challenge them, then they certainly um, they will lift, and you'll get the you'll get the best out of them. So don't don't I guess have the uh, the thought that um, they don't have the skills. They're certainly highly skilled and uh, worth considering. May I add that it's perhaps made the world a little bit smaller for your practice as well. The the cultural benefits it brings by your staff working with offshore workers and the offshore workers getting access to the the beautiful beaches of Newcastle. Yes, ab- absolutely. They uh, the staff. Um, it's like Christmas when they when they turn up our staff from the Philippines. Everyone wants to take them out for lunch or take them whale watching on the weekend. And it's culturally, it's been a, a great um, a great thing to uh, for for our staff as well to experience another culture. Um, even for my, my my children, when uh, when we started bringing staff out, uh, we had them stay at my house, and the experiences that gave gave my children and uh, and it does for the staff seeing you know what what other cultures what they experience and it makes them you know appreciate what they've got in Australia when when they see how how hard the, the Philippine staff work and and what you know how they live it's it's certainly um, much different to Australia so it's a good it's a good wake-up call at those sorts of aspects of it as well but it's good for business and and good good for lots of other aspects of what we do thank you Paul. And John, final words from you, and then um, let's hear about this book offer for our listeners. Yeah, so um, if we have a, a book, which is just just that red one there, um, I will I'll send a free copy of that to anybody that's on this podcast or um, that sees this uh, YouTube video. And uh, all you've got to do is send me an email, John J O N at frontlineaccounting.com, and I'll have someone in the office send that out. And that's got all the, um, I guess, how to make it work, you know, all, all the various stories and things that, you know, can go wrong and how to avoid them and just their own experience over a decade of, of building offshore teams. Yeah, terrific. And that email again is john at frontlineaccounting.com and john with a J-O-N. That's it. No H. Excellent. Look, thank you both for your time. It's been a really interesting discussion and I hope our listeners have got a a better insight into the world of offshoring. Thank you, Robin. Thanks, Robin. Thanks for listening to this episode of Tax Vibe. I've been chatting with Jonathan Ryle, co-founder of Frontline Accounting and Paul Franks, partner at Lamborn Partners. If you've enjoyed this episode, we'd love for you to subscribe, rate and review Tax Vibe wherever you listen. We welcome any feedback and suggestions. To catch all the latest from Tax Vibe and the Tax Institute, join us on LinkedIn. If you're interested in being at the centre of the tax conversation, a membership with the Tax Institute could be just what you need. Stay current and connected with tangible, real world benefits. Learn more at taxinstitute.com dot com dot au. Thanks again. Till next time on Tax Five.